Hey there, and welcome to the 13th edition of the Outdated Wrestling Hour. You know, we got a great wrestling writer of wrestling books on the show today. I've been a writer. I used to write to the wrestlers themselves. Our local TV station used to watch it on my 1964 Philco console. And the announcer would say, write the P.O. Box and get your pictures. So I wrote the P.O. Box, and I got a picture of Reggie Parks. And he wrote on it, Yours in sports. I never knew what yours in sports meant. But I know this. It's the Outdated Wrestling Hour. Hey, Richie Parks was championship material, man. Hi, everybody. It's Bob Smith. I used to work for Pro Wrestling Illustrated and Inside Wrestling and The Wrestler and Sports Review Wrestling and on and on it went. These days, I'm your rapidly aging host of the Outdated Wrestling Hour. I am so glad to have you here, and I am so glad to have tonight's guest To me, he's the preeminent wrestling writer today. He is Brian R. Solomon, the author of the current standing Wrestling Observer Wrestling Book of the Year for his incredible biography of The Sheik. If you haven't read it, by all means do. It will take you back to the 70s like few books I've ever read. It is a work of art, a work of news, a work of brilliance. It's it's the best wrestling book I've ever read. I don't like to say the best about anything, but this one is way up there in my book. And Brian is a very unique fellow, too, and a very cultured, very rounded person. And I think you'll enjoy getting to know him a little bit. He's also the host of his own hit podcast called Shut Up and Wrestle on the Arcadian Vanguard Network. And it's excellent. Just like everything he touches turns to gold, man. So you're going to want to get to know, along with me, Oh, and by the way, I'm going to be on that show. I'm going to be on Shut Up and Wrestle. Uh, I will let you know the exact date through social media when that happens. It's going to be very soon, within the next couple of weeks. So look for that. But hey, enough of my yakking. Let's get on to the interview. Well, I'm really excited, as I was a few weeks ago when I got to speak on this gentleman's podcast. Now he's on my podcast, and I couldn't be more excited. This is the gentleman who recently won the prestigious Wrestling Observer Book of the Year Award for the Sheik, Blood and Fire, the unbelievable real-life story of wrestling's original Sheik. It is a tremendous book. It's the Sheik book I waited my whole life to read. He's got new stuff coming out, all different kinds of things, and we'll talk about all of it. One of the most esteemed writers he's worked, he's writ, he wrote for PWI, like I have, uh, WWE, you name it, he's worked for them. It's Brian R. Solomon. Brian, hello again. Hello, Bob. I'm glad to be able to be on your show now and return the favor. Thanks for having me on. Oh, I appreciate it all. I really don't. It, it really is a pleasure to get to know you because um, we were we were speaking before I hit the record button here, and you're, you're one of the most unique people I've met in terms of wrestling writers because I I had a sports background, and that was about it. I was a sports editor of a smaller New York newspaper who then went on to work for PWI. And said, of course, I got to work with Mike Tyson, which helped. but um, and I wanted a, a journalism award for that. That's that's my high point. My whole career, that's probably the highest point I had. Um, but you, uh, <laughs> your your bio describes you as a pop culture and film writer and English teacher with a master's specialization in Shakespeare. That's right. That doesn't sound like a wrestling <laughs> writer. <laughs> you would be surprised how much how much there is in common with wrestling and Shakespeare. They're, they're, oh, okay, explain. Well, I mean, look, Shakespeare is the ultimate theater. It's the ultimate drama. And uh, I'm not going to sit here and say, I mean, obviously, wrestling is much more uh, created for the masses and it's much simpler. But you have to remember, too, when Shakespeare was writing his stuff that he was writing for everybody. I think that's something that's forgotten. Mm -hmm. He was writing for uh, the common people and he was writing for the aristocrats and the wealthy. And in fact, in the theaters, there would be sections for each. In, In those days, 
Um, believe it or not, the floor seats, the seats near the stage were considered the cheap seats that nobody wanted. Everybody wanted to sit up high so they could look down and see everything. So you had all the rabble up front and he would build stuff into the plays that were designed to play to those people, to make them laugh, to give them characters to boo and to cheer. And then he'd layer in, you know, some of the more sophisticated stuff for some of the more educated people but he had something for everybody. And I think that's what people don't always realize about Shakespeare. So there are commonalities there. I, I see. Okay, I get that now. I never would have, would have thought things in those terms. I'm drawing a blank, but he actually, there was a name for the people that were kind of like the poorer people. It was like a term of endearment. Oh man, I wish I remembered. It, it was actually it was a great term that that was used for that for that segment of his audience that he was very consciously writing for. I forget what it is. Sometimes you'd see, even in a play like Macbeth or Hamlet, where you'd have these very high-minded people speaking in this very high-minded way, in the middle of it, they would be this ridiculous working-class character who was meant to be the character that some of the audience could relate to, who was stuck in the middle of all this, just going like, what the hell is wrong with all these weirdos? You know, <laughs> And that was the character that, that part of the audience was meant to to fixate on. And now, of course, like with anything else, it gets kind of locked away with English majors and English literature programs and high culture and all this stuff. And it gets lost. The fact that Shakespeare was a man of the people. He was the original Dusty Rhodes. <laughs> it's funny how now people say, oh, it's too highbrow for me. Right. Yeah. Most, most people would say, oh, I can't understand it. It's 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 above my you know, learning curve or whatever. <laughs> and um, it's funny how times change. But you're here, obviously, because of, uh, well, not just because of this, but the Chic book. I remember finishing it and immediately jumping on Facebook to your Facebook section or whatever. What do they call those things? Uh, your Facebook area. Oh, my and group. My Shut group, Up and Wrestle group. group. And yeah. I... Oh, I forgot to mention you're also the host of the Arcadian Vanguard podcast, Shut Up and Wrestle, folks. If you haven't heard it, you got to hear it. He has the most unique uh, bunch of guests of any wrestling podcast. People you haven't heard of that you'll want to hear of again after you hear them interviewed by you. So I got to give you props for putting on a really unique array of guests that you have on your show. Thank you. And and our show is going to be coming up soon, by the way. I know oh, the one not. you and I did. All right, great. <laughs> yes. It's great. it's um probably very close, maybe a week or two away from Well, from I'll tell you a little secret. This show's coming out tomorrow. Oh, okay. Well, it's going to come out before the one that we did. Yes. <laughs> so, so folks, if if you may hear something repeated that we don't know, so we'll find out. But in any in any event, a thing that fascinates me about the Sheik book. First, I put you know, I wrote I wrote a little review of it, not even thinking that you'd read it. I just needed to vent because I loved the book with such a passion because I discovered the Sheik late in life. I think we talked about this on your show. Yeah. It, wrestling was territorial when I was a teenager into a, a young adult and I never saw him until I was probably 20, 21, 22 years old. Thanks to Pedro Martinez's PM video company where he had a bunch of Sheik stuff from big time wrestling. And I bought everything that said Sheik on it. It's the first time I ever saw him. And then I like to hurt people and, various youtube as the years have gone by i've gotten to know him better and you know i but i feel like he's like like the last great wrestler i never saw you know because because in territorial days i'm i'm a veteran of those so i'm thinking of your book and i'm thinking this must have been a something to research and finding people who are even still alive for him when he was in, in his prime how, how long did it take you to write this book it took me overall probably, um, I want to say, about from the moment I signed the contract until I handed in the finished manuscript was 15 months, I want to say. Wow. And and honestly, I didn't even – the first six months was just interviewing people and transcribing interviews. I, I signed the, the deal in November 2019, and I don't think I started actually writing – until the summer of 2020, for sure. And that's because also you want to get the idea of the story arc in your head. So you can't just start writing it when you don't know what the story is yet. And the story can't just be, he did this, then he did this, and then he did this, and then he did this. Like you have to get a sense and you get it from talking to people. You get it from researching, looking things up. 
what is this person's story? What are the things to focus on? What are the themes? Almost think of it like you're writing a novel. Like if this was a novel, what are you trying to say? Like you can do that with biography. It doesn't just have to be a list of facts or whatever. You can you can have an arc. And this man most definitely had an arc. I mean, talk about Shakespeare. It, it, it's Shakespearean. <laughs> his, mm-hmm. his rise and fall is, you know, the gorilla book is going to be a very different kind of story, but but hopefully just as compelling. And when he says gorilla folks, he's writing a book about <laughs> the legendary gorilla monsoon. Great. <laughs> That's great. I, I wouldn't even. What a great subject matter. I, I mean, or, and a person to write about, I, I never would have thought of it. And now that you, you know, you announced that you're doing it. I'm like, wow. Uh, so many different facets to that man's life, too, just like the Sheik. And I can't believe no one's endeavored to do it. Like, it's one of the one of those people. I, I think that there's a couple of reasons I could think of as to why now that I've started. One is I think a lot of people were intimidated thinking. Uh, well, he, basically, he, his his life story is the property of WWE or something. Yeah, like that. right. But every, you know, look, they just did an Andre the Giant book a couple of years ago. Pat LaPrade and Bertrand Bear had nothing to do with WWE. And if anything, Andre is even more associated with WWE than Gorilla is. So, I mean, there's that. There's also the sense I think people love drama, conflict. I hate to say it, but you you know we 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 um, are obsessed with these stories of celebrities just kind of ruining themselves and like the the tragedy of their destruction. And Gorilla is a much more benevolent figure. Everybody loved him. There's not a ton of skeletons in the closet. He was a heavy smoker and he liked to play blackjack. You know, I mean, <laughs> that's it. So, but that doesn't mean the man's story can't be interesting in other ways. You, you know what I mean? Like there are very interesting themes, themes to explore. This is somebody who started in the territorial days as a headliner, as one of the biggest monster heels in the entire business, right, right. and then goes on to make a life career of it and stays with the company for life and becomes a part of this entirely new era of, of wrestling and you know, and yes, he had mixed feelings about it, which I'm discovering as I go along. And these are interesting things to get into. You know, he was such a part of the territories right. and then he participated in destroying them. You know, so <laughs> there's something very interesting there. He went from Vince McMahon as a teenager hanging around the office to now he's his boss and he's, you know, doing whatever he wants. And unlike a lot of the other Vince McMahon senior cronies, um, Gorilla was a well-educated man who wanted to really contribute in a real way. It wasn't like a lot of them. It was just, you know, my dad says I have to take care of you for life and you always have a job here. Don't worry about it. You're set. You're not going to get fired. Like there were people like that. Gorilla was not satisfied with just that. He wanted to really be a part of it. And he was. So, I mean, that's what I'm saying. There's a lot of interesting stories to tell. It doesn't just have to be. And then he completely self-destructed and his life fell apart, you know. It doesn't have to be like that, although the worst tragedy of his life most certainly was the loss of his of his son, Joey Morella, which was a devastating thing for him. Mm-hmm. People, a lot of people don't realize how entrenched he was with WWF and WWF before the expansion, even. Uh, he, he, he was a, you know, if you look back to the promotion of the uh, Anoki match, he had a lot to do with that locally here in the New York area um, in terms of like the Shea stadium event. And, you know, he, he was really big behind the scenes for a lot longer. I think than a lot of people realize he was part owner. He yeah. owned 20% of the company. Yeah. So, you know, it, it was him when Vince bought it, Vince's dad had half of it. And the other half was split between Vince's dad's partners, gorilla, Arnie Skoland and Phil Zacco and gorilla. So gorilla had 20% of it. He had to be bought out. So, I mean, he was a powerful guy in the company. He was part of the office. He wasn't just working for the office. He was the office part of it. So, and and even though in later years, he may not have had quite the same level of authority or responsibility, he was still a very important person backstage. The gorilla position is named after him. He was one of those people who, by the way, all these people are now gone. He was one of the people that Vince McMahon would defer to and respect and view as a um, an elder, you know, this is someone I can't mess with. 
I can tell you he was not yelling at Gorilla Monsoon on the headset like he does to Michael Cole and everybody else. Right. You know, you don't do that with Gorilla Monsoon. So that was a very different era of the yes. company. Yeah. Uh, this is exciting news. I'm really looking forward to this one. Uh, let me ask you just one qu- more question about the sheep. Oh, oh yeah, please. I'm sorry to go off on this Gorilla No, tangent. it's okay. I'm loving it. I'm loving every syllable. I, I'm immersed in it right now. So, you know. What got you into wanting to do the sheep? Did you see him in his prime? Were you a kid that, that saw his violence and was repulsed by it? Do you, did any of that enter in, into your reasoning for writing the book? Well, I was born in 1974, so the Sheik's best years were behind him even right. when I was born. Mm-hmm. And I was, I was a WWF kid of the 80s. I didn't really know about the Sheik until I discovered wrestling magazines. Right. And actually, at the time, I started buying a lot of wrestling magazines in high school in the early 90s, the Sheik was still active. He was still, he was in Japan. He would do the occasional indie in America. And there were pictures, like I told you before, I read one of your columns about the Sheik, about, it was about 90, 91. 91, I think. That yeah. you did about how, hey, everybody, the Sheik is still out there wrestling. Surprise, you know. And um, so I became interested from there. I remember uh, there was a picture that ran, the famous picture of when he burned the referee Johnny Red Shoes Dugan's face right. in Los Angeles, which I guess apparently they did with sandpaper. I don't know how they, there was some kind of trick to it. And I saw this in the ma- one of the magazines, they ran an old photo. And, you know, I am, uh, I'm watching Hulk Hogan, the ultimate warrior. I'm watching all this very kind of silly kid centered wrestling. And this is intriguing to me. What is, is this guy, is he burning people? Is mm-hmm. this is this part real? What's happening? This is not what I imagine wrestling to be. And that fascinated me. And I just, as I became more interested in wrestling history, I started to do more research. And from an early age and early, I'm talking about like in my 20s when I was really, you know, starting to write about wrestling and mm-hmm. try to teach myself about wrestling history, the Detroit Territory was fascinating to me because it's like this weird it's like a lost civilization it's it was it was the it was a t- it's a territory you don't hear a lot of talk about anymore unless you're from that area and it was once one of the hottest if not the hottest for a yes. couple of years territories in the whole business and it just flamed out like that and and th- that's part of the mystique to me you know mm-hmm. and and so when i would write like i wrote a book years ago called pro wrestling faq and it had a section about the Sheik. And I started researching him then. And I and it just started going around in my head of, hey, you've never done a wrestling biography. That's kind of the books in, that everybody loves to read, the biographies, you know. Who's somebody you could do that's a huge name that's never had a book? There aren't many people like that, especially from that era. I could not think of anyone who was a bigger star than the Sheik who did not already have a book. Right, at, at least from days of old. And so that became the click in my head of this is the time to do it. You know, this, this, and, and you can cover all of Detroit wrestling history too in the book. And I did. Yes, you did. And, and you know, it's funny too. Here's what killed off Toronto and Detroit. It was the same match in front of the same people over mm-hmm. and over again. Here, here's, here's, here's my recollection for the amount of videos they would be able to watch. Bell rings, face takes over, Sheik starts to bite, gouge, and stab. Baby face makes a comeback, fireball, one, two, three. And that description is probably longer than some of the matches he had, right? Yeah, and and he he would rely on that more and more as time went on, and especially, um, you know, his peak years are mm-hmm. not really, unfortunately, preserved on film. Not no, much they're not. It. It's interesting. There's stuff from the 50s, like in the Chicago archives, from the old Chicago amphitheater shows, where you can see him in his mid-card phase, where he's really working a very conventional style. He's really yeah. just he's just doing a straight-up wrestling match. you know. And then you can see him late in his career, when he's doing like what you said, when he's, his mobility's gone, he's not really bumping, he's not selling. He's just doing these quick and dirty matches. The middle part of his career, the 60s, the heyday, you know, especially heading into the late 60s, the very beginning of the 70s, very little out there to see. And I'm not saying that he was Luthez or something, but 
he was able to work a little more and do a little more in those earlier years. Like the fire thing, he first started doing fire in the late 50s. It was something that, especially if you were following him in Detroit, let's say, or Toronto, he might break it out like once or twice a year. And you would go, oh, when is he going to use the fire? I don't know. How long has it been? And then it got to the point where it was every match, you know? Right. And it was just to take away from the fact that he couldn't do that much else. So it's hard to tell. I always tell people the Japanese stuff. The Japanese were so much better at preserving the footage. And I think it's because yeah. somebody told me it's because the promotions were not in charge of it. The TV studios were. And the TV studios had ownership or they preserved it or whatever. But you can watch unbelievable chic stuff from all Japan from the 70s yeah. that will give you an idea of the mayhem of the chic better than just about anything that's out there. One of the reasons the Sheik was one of the ultimate heels of all time, in my eyes, was his countenance. It's not even so much what he did. It was the look on his face, the unbreakable, sinister leer that he had. You know, that just the overall aura of him that would make crowds separate when he came walking down the aisle. I mean, he had it. He had that X factor that most heels only wish they could achieve. And that is all part of working. You know, like it bothers me today when you have fans and wrestlers, especially who have a, I feel sometimes a limited idea of what working is when they think it's just what moves do you know? And, you know, what's your work rate or this or that or the other thing. You can watch a Larry Zabisco match. Say what you will about the guy. He'll, it'll be 10 minutes before he even touches the, the opponent. Exactly. But you are ready to kill that man by that mm -hmm. point. And I mean that in a complimentary way. Yes. The crowd wants his blood by that point. That's working. And the Sheik had his style of working. There's a there's a story in the book about Eddie Jr. where Eddie Jr. wants to learn how to be a wrestler. And he says to his dad, the Sheik, he says, well, I, I want to learn how to wrestle. It's too bad that you don't really know how to wrestle. You can't really show me anything. What are you going to show me how to stab people? And the Sheik goes, oh, yeah, come on, come in the ring. And he stretched the hell out of him from all four to all four corners of the ring. And his son is just like, I didn't know you could do that. Why don't you do that? And the sheet goes, I don't have to do that. I made a fortune doing what I do. Why would I do it any different? And it's like what Hulk Hogan told me once too, when I worked for WWE, he told me this backstage at the Regis and Kathy Lee show. I don't even understand how this got, how it started, but he said he had just come from WCW. He had just come back to WWE. And so he was saying, you know, people like to rave and talk about people like Rey Mysterio and Chris Benoit at the time, Eddie Guerrero, Dean Malenko, Chris Jericho. They can come out there and they fly. They, they send them out there first match. They fly around the ring. Crowd goes nuts. They're moving 100 miles an hour, doing these incredible moves. People are coming unglued. He goes, main event time. I go out there. I put my hand to my ear. He told me this. I put my hand to my ear. I get the same exact reaction that they got doing all those things. So why would I do what they do when I'm doing what I do? They do what they do. It's great. I do what I do. I'm the main event. I'm the world champion. Th this is what they expect from me. So there was that idea that of, so there's a diversity of working styles. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't, it has nothing to do with moves. <laughs> Yes. Uh, I mean, charisma is charisma. I mean, some people have it, some people don't. But, you know, it kind of bothers me, me about current wrestling. It's like, oh, the work rate, la di da di da In the day, people were really stationary in the ring, but they still got over. I mean, like Fred Blassie, especially late in his career, was still drawing a massive amount of heat. To, you know, the Tolis era, was it 71, 72, 73? Yeah, and his knees were he shot. Could by barely walk. Yeah. But he was as over as anybody in wrestling at that point because he had his psychology. It was just working perfectly. Tullus was the perfect foil and bang, box office magic. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, uh, sometimes you know, it's interesting. I, I'm not against critiquing workers and matches and critiquing work rate or whatever. But the problem with it is it's a it's a very inside thing. Right. So it started in things like the Wrestling Observer and among very, very smart fans. And that's all well and good. You know what? You know what? Because I'm sure there's people in all walks of life, in all forms of entertainment 
you could have Hollywood insiders, you know, real kind of like behind the scenes people who will look at a movie and will see things that none of us will see and will go, oh, that's terrible. Oh, that's that's awful. But it doesn't matter. People love it. You know, I understand that there's a place for that. But it's when that insider thinking infiltrates the entire fan base Mm -hmm. and then and infiltrates locker rooms where you have wrestlers worrying about their work rates. I mean, wrestlers used to worry about the houses they were drawing, you know, wrestlers should be worrying about how much money is in their envelope, not, you know, how many stars I get for my match. I mean, come on, you know, that that's for the nerds like us. That's not for them. But you know, I look at I look at things a little differently because I was around then and now. And I'll tell you what, I am of the serious opinion that today's wrestlers work too hard. They and do. I'm afraid that the risk of serious injury has never been greater. I mean, and I care. I I know how hard it is. I got to know Mick Foley quite well, you know, during my magazine days before he broke big and. You know, he gave up his entire life basically to learn how to be a wrestler and working for $15 shots in the beginning of his career and just working his way up the ladder. I mean, somehow he knew how to do the wild stuff. He didn't protect his body, but today everybody does the wild stuff. You know, it's like, it's part of a match now, a lot of aerial stuff and a lot of high impact maneuvers. And I just think I I just cringe sometimes watching even WrestleMania this past couple of weeks ago. You know, I, I just think sometimes they just work too hard. I, I Maybe I'm too much of a pacifist or something, but I, I, I worry about the risk of injury with these people. I really do. Because it's a business. You're you're in there doing business. And, yeah. You know, I just, one of the most recent episodes of my show, which hasn't, which actually will be airing next week, is I did an interview with Mar- a woman named Mary Freeze, who is the daughter of Pampero Furpo. Oh, Yeah. And, she was telling me about his perspective. And I think it was a perspective of a lot of the old timers. They would watch modern wrestling and they would go, these guys are incredible. These guys are way better athletes than most of us were. We could never do the things that they're doing, but they're pushing themselves too hard. And you don't have to do these things. You don't have to destroy your body. The idea is that you're supposed to protect your body. You're supposed to make it look crazy but protect yourself and protect your opponent and these guys are going to regret it and you already start to see that even from the some of the guys from the 80s and 90s generation you know right. uh, and it's only going to get worse they don't like to hear it these guys they don't sometimes they'll even get hostile if you mention it, and you try to warn them or give them advice or whatever but you know look at what happened to dynamite kid exactly look at mick foley look at what look at terry funk i mean And Terry Funk was a guy from the old school who modified his style to fit in with what was going on in the business to stay relevant. Mm -hmm. You and and he was incredible. Maybe the greatest of all time, honestly. Maybe. But but these things take a toll. The human body is a physical, real thing made of flesh and blood. These people are not cartoon characters, you know? So anyway, with all this stuff going on, I see you have a brand new book coming out called Superheroes. I was a comics geek as a kid, the Jack Kirby, Neil Adams, Stan Lee era. Um, the full name of the book is Superheroes, the History of a Pop Culture Phenomenon from Ant-Man to Zorro. Oh, boy. Tell us about this, please. Yeah, it's funny. It, it's, it, it has, I don't want to say slipped through the cracks, but with all the wrestling stuff I do, it's almost like um, I don't. I haven't talked a lot about it. I... It was a project that I took on around the same time as the Sheik, but I had to put it off because I was working on Sheik. So I pi- I actually pitched Superheroes first. I didn't – to a different publishing company. I didn't hear anything back from them. I was like, okay. I waited like a month. And I said, all right, back to wrestling it is, I guess. And then I pitched the Sheik book to ECW Press. They said yes. About a month after that, the the company I had pitched the superheroes book to finally followed up and said, sure, sounds good. And I'm like, okay, guys, um, we got to work this out now. And, and they were willing to like kind of extend it and wait. So I essentially jumped immediately from the Sheik book. I was done writing it, but the book hadn't been published yet. It was still in production. And I was already onto the superheroes book, which 
is nice now that they're both done and they're out there and they're going in the world. At the time, it was torture and madness. And I'm trying to close the, you know, the tie up the loose ends of one book and I'm writing another book. And so my attentions were divided. And then I and then I went I went into Gorilla, you know. So this book, I'm I, I also feel like with a soup with a book like this about superheroes, and it's coming out around Father's Day, which was intentional. I, as the author, am, am incidental. This is the kind of book where it doesn't even matter. You put it in a window at a bookstore in June, and it says the history of superheroes. People are buying that book. It could be the worst book ever. I'm not saying this is. I'm very proud of it. But what I'm but 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 what I'm saying is that's my reasoning for why I didn't talk about it as much. I feel like it doesn't need as much help from me to promote mm-hmm. it as trying to sell people on a book about the Sheik who who peaked 50 years ago in pro wrestling and 90% of wrestling fans under the age of 40 have never heard of, you know. So I knew that that was going to be more work. But the superhero book is is, is more in line with the pro wrestling FAQ book I did and the Godzilla FAQ book that I did, which is it's more of like a general single volume type of reference book. Everything you ever wanted to know about blank, that kind of thing. I love the applause books. That's the imprint on those books. And they made yes. my favorite Street Stooges book too. I'm a Street Stooges mark. Yeah, it's it's part of the FAQ series. So they basically, right. they put the FAQ series to bed. And what they started doing, because the company changed hands. It used to be run by Hal Leonard, the music publishers. Right, yeah. Hal Leonard handed it off to a company called Roman and Littlefield, which is a British publishing company. And what one of the decisions they made was to do away with the whole idea of a series FAQ. And I I can't speculate as to why. I mean, I mean, I guess I can speculate. Maybe they thought that it made them too generic. Maybe they wanted each book to have its own identity. So this superheroes book, you know, if I had done it five years ago, it probably would have been called superheroes FAQ. Right. right. But, but it has its own identity. It stands out on its own and, and, uh, you know, it gets its own kind of title and everything. And I'm excited to see hopefully that that it finds an audience. Now, it says from Ant Man to Zorro. That's A to Z. There you go. <laughs> it takes me back to my PWI for hundred days. A to Z. That's how I used to do it. Invariably, stuff got left out. Did you have any kind of a problem with the comics characters going? Oh, geez, I forgot. You know, Super Dog or something. You know, there's always things like that. It's also it's not just I forgot. It's I don't have room for <laughs> all of this. Something's got to go. One thing, and I guess it's because I love wrestling so much there's one thing i i definitely would have wanted to put in i didn't think about it till it was too late but superhero characters within wrestling i thought would have been fun like the hurricane and mighty molly and they just had um uh a a character in wwe recently uh um nikki ash right she took on a superhero character rosie too right rosie rosie right rosie was and there was even going way back like the blue blazer and I, I I thought I was kicking myself about that. I thought that would have been fun because I did include I had a section on luchadors and how, you know, El Santo and Blue Demon and Mil Mascaras, they they did movies and they were treated like superheroes. They were fighting bad guys. They weren't just pro wrestlers. They were something more than that. So I did have that in there, but nothing from American pro wrestling. Interesting. Uh, this is Well, I'm a mark for your writing, man. And, you know, after that Sheik book and various other things that I've come in contact with, what a career you're having. Is is it going as well as it seems? Is this kind of like a high point for you right now as we speak in terms of, uh, you know, books? Well, I, I'm busy as hell. I mean, yeah. I have never been this busy in wrestling since it was my full-time job back when I worked at WWE, mm-hmm. where it was my nine-to-five job five days a week. Right. Um, I mean, I have a lot on my plate and, um, you know, I do the wrestling news every day. I write the script for it every single day. Oh, I didn't realize that. For Arcadian Vanguard. Right, right. Um, there are some days, you know, it's my son's birthday. Can I please not do it today? Like <laughs> that happens sometimes. And I have the wonderful and amazing Mike Sempervivi who he's the anchor and he's the voice of it. Mm-hmm. And he also, he does the production. I mean, he's a wizard. And he also handles some of the writing. Like a lot of times he'll specialize in the Mexican or Japanese stuff. He'll kind of beef up the script with that. He's a little bit more in tune, especially with Japan. 
I always get a kick out of hearing him pronounce all the the Mexican wrestlers' names. It's sort of like when Mike Bloomberg would try to speak Spanish to his <laughs> constituents. I tease him about that. But but I you know so I'm doing that. I've got these books. I write for Pro Wrestling Illustrated. I co-host their podcast with Al Castle, and I write for Inside the Ropes, the UK magazine. So there's a lot. It's a lot going on. And I mean, and there's other random things like I help out with the International Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame, the one in Albany. I do. I I, I work on I help work on their program, things like that. And, um, you know, it's it's organic. I'm trying to make it grow as much as I can possibly make it grow. And Mm -hmm. So I'm strictly just doing this. That would be great. I mean, I, you know, I have other things I do on the side. I'm not in a classroom these days as a teacher, right. but I do tutoring and I do like one-on-one and small groups and instruction and things like that, you know, in it, but I'm in addition to the wrestling stuff. Well, Craig Peters and I were talking on my show a few weeks ago, and I think maybe in your case, it's kind of like what we experienced when you're really enjoying yourself and ain't work. Right. And no, it, it motivates you. You it know? motivates you. That's the thing. Right. Like, like there are times where I'm insanely busy and I'm di- and I'm like freaking out. Like, how am I going to have time to do all this? But because you love it, you motivate yourself more. You can push yourself more because you're enjoying it. So even when you're under crazy deadlines and there's pressure and you're going, oh my god, can you know, can this wait? Um, you still get it done because you love what you do. Like I, you know, I'm the kind of person, and this has been my downfall, it was my downfall in school, and it's been my downfall professionally. I cannot apply myself to things that I don't find stimulating. I will flop. Mm-hmm. And that's why like even in school, um I was a straight A student until I got to the higher grades where math and science become very important and math and science almost killed me. Because I had no interest in it. I could not push myself to learn it. And it almost tanked me. Like, like even when I took the SAT, I, I, did, I got almost perfect on the verbal and the analytical, the writing part of it. The math part of it killed me. And, you know, I, there were schools rejected me because, because it was so lopsided. And the same things happen, you know, as professional. Like, like I have been in jobs where I'll go into a fetal position. Like mm. my, that's my response. If, <laughs> if there's all this pressure on me and all this stuff looming and it's got to get done and it's stuff that I hate and can't stand and it's boring as hell and I detest it. Mm. My response is, okay, here's my strategy. I'll do nothing. <laughs> that's basically what my, and magically it will just go away. Like, you know, it's funny about my career. That's In my sec- magical thinking. The second half of my career, I did more editing than writing. And I really learned to enjoy the nuts and bolts of putting out – I put out an entertainment publication in Long Island here for 17 years. And I enjoyed the nuts and bolts of getting the thing out, you know, of, 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 of compiling it, editing it, getting it ready for publication. I, I, I learned that side of the business and I enjoyed it. But I'm kind of like you. I miss standards and I was – I turned down two – one more than the other, two lucrative opportunities to – write for the web i won't do seo i'm not even going to bother learning it it's against my every principle agreed not for me not i for fell me. into that world and that's one of the things that caused me to reassess my whole career because mm-hmm. i started in writing and editing i started in book publishing transitioned into magazines by the time i left wwe then you're getting into this is now the late 2000s you're getting into a world where books and magazines are not the force they used to be especially magazines Everything's switching to the web. Quality is out the window. Everything's about SEO and mm-hmm. basically spamming the Google algorithm and all this garbage. And I found myself slowly but surely, one job after another, becoming a marketing person. Right. Uh, and I'm like, how the hell did this happen? <laughs> what I what am I doing? I, I'm mm-hmm. I, I'm writing newsletters about chocolate covered fruit and communi- <laughs> communicating with franchisees. I'll let you read between the lines of what company I was working for, uh, worst place I ever worked for. And that was when I said, you know what? I got to change this up. Yeah. And and I got into teaching because that was my original um, love or my original idea of what I wanted to do. I actually wanted to teach on a college level. I never went through getting like a PhD and really investing the time. I, I got out into the working world. And so I went through a program to teach secondary school, to teach high school 
which I found a lot more rewarding and a lot more of like what I wanted to be doing with myself, something I could be proud of. And I enjoyed it. I did it for a number of years. I also found there's a lot of politics in that world. And there's a lot of infiltration of kind of the corporate mindset, unfortunately, into public education. Um, between that and the pandemic, like there uh, was a, there was another reassessment that happened. <laughs> yeah. And I started doing more and more stuff at home and kind of changing what I was focusing on. Like the stuff I do now, a lot of it, the writing, the editing, podcasting, those were things that I had been doing for years, but just on the side, in the spare moments of whenever I could carve out some time, you know, and obviously, therefore, it wasn't a lot of what I did and it didn't bring in a lot of, of my income. But then, you know, I'm home, I'm here all day, I have nowhere to go. Okay, this is my nine to five now. So, like, for example, the Sheik book, that became right. my nine to five job. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I would have been able to invest as much energy and make it as thorough as it was if I was not. I would I would wake up in the morning, go down to my office, nine to five, work on that book like a job. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just writing from nine to five. I mean, you can't do that. But it was everything else, everything around it just dedicated to that. It became my job. And I don't think the book would have turned out the same way if it was something that I was doing just like for an hour or two at night when I'm exhausted after a full day's work would have been a very different kind of book. So that's why I've leaned into this. I'm trying, praying, begging, crossing my fingers. I have a very loving and supporting wife who has health insurance for the family. And I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to make this work and it's been working. <laughs> that's wonderful. That's great. Um, and on top of all of that, the cherry on the cake or the frosting is shut up and wrestle. Yes. Uh, obviously, that's a labor of love, I would think, more than anything else. Am I right? Am I yes. assuming that correctly? I had toyed with the idea of doing a podcast for years because my what I originally thought was, well, I used to work at WWE. I have these crazy stories that nobody knows about. Um, maybe I could do something with that. And then I'm going, well, you know, not a lot of people know who you are. You don't want to overstate your notoriety you know there's people that have way better stories than me so i started thinking well it has to be more than that what if it was just a lot i would have guests and it would be you know because i know that was the other thing laziness so <laughs> i know i know enough people in the business i i am well acquainted with enough interesting people in the business that guests I knew would not be a problem i would not have to cold call people and introduce myself to people that don't know me at least not for a few years. <laughs> I've got enough people. And I started thinking this and then thinking, should I have a co-host? Like, where do I put it? And I was going to do it as a completely independent thing. But what happened was I wound up kind of coming into the orbit of Arcadian Vanguard. Um, I was invited as a guest on one of the 605 Super Podcasts talking about the Wrestling Observer Hall of Fame because I was a member of the Facebook group and I kind of like raised my hand when they were looking for people to talk about that. Mm -hmm. I, I started with that, but, you know, I was talking to Brian. He thought we hit it off really well. He, he had me co-host the 605 with him. Then he had me come on Jim Cornette's show to talk about the book. And we talked for an hour and a half about the Sheik book. I could, which I couldn't believe it. And I was so grateful to Jim and Brian for, I mean, they helped make that book by that kind of exposure. Mm -hmm. And I, I, it would not have been the success it's been without them helping to get the ball rolling like that. And so, but that's what kind of got me in the orbit. And then, so when I kind of innocently said, hey, uh, on Twitter, you know, hey, would you guys be interested if I did a podcast? I'm kind of thinking about it. Anybody care? And Brian last reached out to me right away and said, would you do it with us? You know, and, 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 and it was almost like, it was almost like, I think he was kind of thinking like, well, why didn't you come to me? Why didn't you bring it to me? And I said, I, I wouldn't have presumed you would have cared. You know, I don't, I don't have an overinflated view of myself. Yeah, so I, I, I'm yeah. thinking about well, you, you have Jim Cornette doing a show here. You've got, you know, like, what, what are you going to want mm -hmm. me just talking? But he did. And he said, let's do it. It could be part of our platform and part of, our, you know, our offerings and things. And, um, and I was su super grateful because, again, it's like you're starting. You don't have to start from scratch building an audience. Right. You, you've got this thing behind you and, and you've got uh, some a measure of goodwill. People that enjoy the Arcadian Vanguard shows that will try out my show. And they did.
And, well, and, th- there's the thing. Brian has standards. Yes. Brian has high standards. He won't he won't put anything into a podcast unless he knows it's major league. I, well, I'm convinced of that. And every show that he has is excellent. You know, I, I really enjoy his entire soup the nuts line of podcast. And you know, the reason I started this thing, you know, John and Rizzi called me late twenty twenty one and said, Would you like to be my co host? Because he had a out he had a falling out with Brian Lass. He wanted to keep going with the Pro Wrestling Spotlight franchise. I've been on his show years ago and I said, sure. And at the end of last year, for some reason, John says, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to want to go in a new direction. I said, All right. Then one episode went by without me on it. And here's Facebook and Twitter and my email box. And I am hearing from people. I don't even know going, where'd you go? I said, right then and there, I'm not stopping. You know, that was my whole impetus for going on. I had all these people that I knew and didn't know that missed me on that show. I said, well, I'm going to do my own. And I'll be darned if they didn't all follow me here. And I'm really appreciative of that, you know. And it's like sometimes you got to realize you're you're building an audience by being on other shows. And, you know, it helps to speak speak wherever you can get your voice heard, you know. And that's probably the secret to getting on yourself, I guess. Well, that's why I, I do many, many appearances on other shows. And that's part of my thinking on it is mm-hmm. the more I do that, the more I get my face out there, people know who I am. It's like osmosis. Like I have friends who are just friends of mine in real life who happen to be wrestling fans who will say to me now and then like, you're everywhere. Like, what? and I'll be like, where, what do you mean I'm everywhere? Well, he, and they'll be like, I just randomly see you pop up on social media on some show or another, some YouTube thing. I'm not even looking for it. There you are talking about something or another. And I start going, wow, it's working. It's actually working. It's just I, I'm in the ether. you know? Right, right. I, and it, it, like I always say, too, uh, the PWI thing obviously doesn't hurt you because I worked full time for PWI for six years, from 88 to 93, whatever it is. I can't. I've never been able to break away from it. And when I left there, you know, I only left because they moved in 93. Now picture this, mind you, I had bought property. I walked to work some days. I I thought I was set for life at PWI. Then Stanley walks in and goes, I'm selling the company. My whole life went crashing down because I couldn't go with them. Even if I wanted to, I couldn't sell that property. I just bought property. So it, it was like, I had to stay back. I had to stay in the New York area. And there was no internet. If you can imagine kids, no internet, no cell phones. This was all just right before that period hit. You know, I was, well, screwed. So that's the only reason I left PWI. So it's like, but the six years I was there, I, I I put it in a drawer and I locked it away for decades and I shouldn't have done that. I'm finding that out now. I really kind of walked away from it. Like I said, I started a music career and all this other stuff. I should not have pushed it aside because I'm finding out that, and you're finding this out now, that what you did, if it's good, it has value. It entertains people. It's, it's something that sticks with folks. And that's a nice feeling that after all these years, people go, I remember you did it. I remember when you wrote this. I remember when you wrote that. Yes. And I'm since I'm doing the podcast, I'm hearing from wrestlers going, you gave me a push back in 91 or 92. It feels awesome. I mean, you know, considering that I kind of stopped doing all this, it's weird, but I love it. You know, I'm back and I'm enjoying it. And I have that experience now too, myself, because I worked for WWE's publications right. From mm-hmm. 2000 to 2007. So now here we are in 2023. You have a generation of young fans who grew up. And these are people who will now say this to me. And I didn't think of this when we were doing it back then. For us, it was it was throwaway stuff. We were having fun. It was great. Right. It was an awesome job. But we weren't thinking like, oh, they're going to remember this. It was just like... You know, it was WWE magazine, Raw magazine, SmackDown magazine, and we're just trying to put out a decent magazine and and not get fired. And now here we are. (laughs) I have people that would just say, oh, my God, uh, that thing you did on so-and-so and and this piece you did back then, and they'll they'll show me the cover and they still have it. And, you know, that that helped me even get in the door with Inside the Ropes because 
those are guys who are huge wrestling fans from the UK. They grew up on that WWF boom that happened there in like the early 90s when the WWF crossed over into the UK and it became a huge phenomenon. And so like they they work with me. They work with Keith Elliott Greenberg. They brought Bill Apter on. Right. People who are associated with the wrestling magazines that they remember reading, they now want to work with. So it's be, it's become something I I never really even thought of. I mean, I have wrestlers now who come up to me and go, "Hey, when I was a kid, I read your articles in mm -hmm. WWE magazine." Yeah, it is so weird, and I never even at the time when I worked there that would happen within the company, and it would always blow me away because I would I never thought about how people are actually reading this, if that makes sense. I would just do my job and right. put it out there. But like I've said, I remember like Foley was one. Steve Austin was another one. When I, I, I didn't meet them until I was already a couple of years in. And I would be introduced to these people. And because my name is in print, they would hear my name and they would go, oh, I know who you are. I read all your stuff. And I'm going, you're, you're Stone Cold Steve Austin. What are you talking about? You know who I am. Like he didn't even want me to introduce myself. He was just like, huh. I've been reading your articles for years. Of course I know who you are. Isn't that, isn't that a strange feeling? It's Crazy. like, uh, I remember going to Memphis in 91 and seeing Chris Candido, he was working there and he goes, how come I went down 40 spots in the 500? <laughs> and I'm like, hum and hum. I didn't even know how to respond to it. I went, oh my God, everybody's taking this thing so seriously. And they were. Peterbury 500 people take really damn seriously. Even, even more now. It's, yeah. it's, it's all over Twitter. The mm -hmm. wrestlers post their rankings. I mean, People get bent out of shape. People that get left out. I think. I think this year we left out one of the members of FTR, and it was like, oh, oh my god! See how easy that is to do. It, it happens. Too, it happens. It, happens. Yeah, it does happen. And poor, poor Kevin. Kevin McIlvain. You know, he has to take the brunt of that. Mm -hmm. And I feel like you know, when it comes time for PWI to come out, and to a lesser degree, the PWI awards, but when it comes time for the PWI 500 to come out, I almost feel like. We all need to check on Kevin and make sure he's okay. Like maybe I send him like a care package or something because he'll get hammered. You know, I mean, with every little thing, people people live and die by it. Yeah, you know, I, I did have some dealings with Kevin a couple of years ago, and I found him to be a really great guy. And I'm glad he's uh, running the helm now. I think that's uh, a good move on their part, and hopefully they'll keep it going for a long time. Because I can't imagine a world without wrestling magazines. <laughs> you know, when you and I were kids, there was a whole row on the newsstand of wrestling magazines and now you have to look for pwi it's 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 a mine it, it makes me crazy i can't you know i never thought magazines would become somewhat passe I it's miss not it. wrestling so much as magazines in general everything's a niche now i know i miss it so much and wrestling magazines especially i miss that idea you know again i don't know if it's maybe part of it is like the city experience of growing up compared to suburban i mean mm -hmm. i had the newsstand i would walk to a couple of blocks from the house they would have, you know, seven, eight, nine different wrestling magazines at a time Yo, every gosh. week. You'd pick out the one like those experiences. They're gone. Yes. And yes. magazines in general, you know, like I went into my local CVS and all of a sudden one day, boom, no more magazines, magazine section gone. I'm like, what? You, you guys aren't selling magazines anymore. Like, what, what, what are we what are we doing here? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll go to the doctor's office. There's no magazines. The, the mm -hmm. magazine racks are empty. Why? Everybody's just looking at their phone. Why are they going to bother with the subscriptions for magazines? Yeah, I know. And I'm sitting there going like, where's Entertainment Weekly? Like, hello, I'm a magazine guy. You know, even after all these years, one of my favorite memories of wrestling was summers off from high school and me and my friend Rick at Williams Lunch in Catskill, New York, because they had a magazine rack, grabbing inside wrestling or wrestling world and talking about the wrestlers after all the people I've met and all the things I've done, that's still one of my fondest memories of wrestling magazines is, is, is going over. And when I got the job, <laughs> the rest of, it blew my high school friend away. He said, you're working for them? I said, yeah. And he was like, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. And he was thrilled about it. And, you know, it's because we spent all those days eating cheeseburgers and reading about, you know, Greg the Hammer Valentine, you know. So those are memories that never leave you if you're a wrestling guy, you know. It's, it's the best. Absolutely. I mean, we, you know, attending the cars, the cards locally at an armory, which in Albany, which is our big arena, be a B WWF area. But 
we we would scheme to get there. We walked to another county to buy tickets once. Is is we're just crazy. We're just crazy fans, and uh, those are the good memories. You know, you have anything like that from when you were a kid? Well, I mean, well, you mean like just walking up to go see a show, like that kind of thing? Well, yeah, it's like being young and impressionable and 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 learning learning it as you went along, that type of thing. Yeah, I mean, you know, in terms of wrestling, I actually had an interesting experience because. Because I, li- I grew up in the city, so my very first show I ever went to is Madison Square Garden. I mean, nice. I was right. I was off to the races. I mean, you know, my grandfather took me. I'll never forget. It was July 1987, my first show. Hulk Hogan was the champion, but he was not on the show because this was back when they had the A and the B. Right. And believe it or not, I guess they didn't consider MSG to be the A. I don't know. Maybe it's because it was a house show. And so in, in that era, that particular era, 87, Ricky Steamboat was headlining the B shows. So the shows that Hogan wasn't on. So our main event was Ricky Steamboat trying to get the intercontinental belt back from the hockey tonk man. We had that. We had British Bulldogs versus the Hart Foundation, which I think was the last time they wrestled each other at the garden. We had the MSG debut of Ravishing Rick Rude. I mean, it was a big show. And that was the beginning for me. I started going to Indies in Brooklyn in the early 90s when I was still in high school. And it was such a different experience back then because indies pre-ECW and post-ECW are completely different. You know, before all of the independents started trying to be ECW and have their like rabid kind of niche fans, it was such a different thing. It was all kids, families, little old ladies, you know, the mm-hmm. guy from the corner grocery store, you know, and the card would be a combination of, you know, kind of on the way down former WWF people and people on the way up that were local people that were trying to get noticed and discovered. And but it would almost always be headlined by the kind of somewhat over the hill WWF names that they were using to try to draw a show. Like the first one I went to was at Lafayette High School in Brooklyn. It was the Savoldis, International World Class Championship Wrestling. Right. And the main event was Tony Atlas, who was the IWCCW champion perennially, again, versus Greg the Hammer Valentine. And I remember going, and this is like summer of 91, right. and I'm a teenager, and I'm going, I, I didn't really know what indie wrestling was. And I'm going, this is unthinkable. Like, how, I'm going to a high school gym in my neighborhood to see these television wrestling stars in front of like, you know, in a school auditorium. That's crazy. You know, I didn't I didn't even know you could do this. So like <laughs> those are my early kind of discoveries mm-hmm. of wrestling uh in a way that I think is is it would be a very different experience for a new fan today. Well, you know, it's it's funny cuz I I have I, I'm older than you and I go back to the 70s my first cards and it was the same thing. It was the same vibe. I'm from a small town originally in upstate New York, so to go we had to drive to Albany to see the matches and those cards were literally they would match up prelim guys the first three matches and then they'd have a co-main event and then a main event and they they weren't even the biggest main events it would be Ivan Putski versus somebody you know whatever baron was around at that point but still it was larger than life um Back then, there was smoke in the arenas. You know, it, it was you know dollar hot dogs and the Norman Kaiser programs, and and even though we watched you know Rocky Tamayo against Joe Turco, we left mesmerized. I, you can't even you can't even figure out why, but you just you were thoroughly entertained. I never left a wrestling match and said that was awful. I loved every minute of it. It was a treat. And the way that they structured those shows back then too, and you can still see them like if you watch an old MSG house show or something, mm-hmm. let's say. Uh, wrestling, the presentation of a wrestling show was really changed by pay, things like pay-per-view, Saturday right. night's main event, Clash of the Champions, because it became a TV ratings thing where you didn't want people to change the channel. So, and and in the case of pay-per-view, you know, when you ordered a pay-per-view, you could actually cancel the order within the first half hour if you wanted to. So they had to grab people. So it would have to be top to bottom, your best matches, your best stars, hook them quickly. And, you know, because you don't want them to change the channel or get a refund. It, when you're doing a live show, when it's a live event business, the, the, the strategy is the complete opposite. Because you're going, 
These people bought a ticket. We have their money. They're here. They're not going to get up and walk out. They're waiting to see the main event. They're waiting to see the big matches on the end of the card. So what you do is you build the show gradually, slowly. That's why a lot of times when people watch those shows now and they try to like rate them, the first few matches, they'll just be like, this is friggin' terrible. What is this? This is boring. What? Am I? But the, that's the idea is not that it's boring, but the idea is you build it. The opening match guys are not throwing chairs. They're mm -hmm. not jumping off the top rope. They're not bleeding. It's like you said, preliminary guys against each other. It's setting a baseline. You're at a wrestling show, right? Baseline. This is what a wrestling show is. And then as the show goes on, it gets wilder, crazier. The matches get better. There's more violence. There's more rule breaking. There's more insanity. That was the way a show was structured back right. then. They don't really do it that way anymore, you know? Nope. Nope. Op openers are as hot as the main events. Yes. Yes. Or you'll see guys that will do the same spots. In different yeah, matches. Yeah. yeah. Through the, like, aren't you guys talking to each other? Like, what are we doing? Yeah. Wow. Well, Brian, I just I just want to tell you, and I hope you don't think I'm blowing smoke at you, but uh, I think you have put yourself in the uh, category of someone who will be known forever for your wrestling writing at this point. Uh, there's no question in my mind, like a Greg Oliver or someone like that, that you will be synonymous with wrestling journalism from this point on, thanks to the Sheik book. And that must have been quite a feeling to, to win the Observer Book of the Year award. Uh, how, when that hit you, how did you react to that? I didn't I didn't expect it. I, I really did not at all. And I mean that because I, I'm thinking, I don't know if the Observer readership is going to vote for a book like this. I know with their track record, a lot of times it's the newer wrestlers. It's the ones that are popular now or things like that. And understandably, and like last, you know, I remember thinking, well, it's going to be the Brian Gewertz book. That's kind of what everybody was thinking. I remember talking to Keith Elliott Greenberg because he had an excellent book on wrestling during the pandemic era. It's called follow the buzzards. And that book didn't even place. It didn't even place. And that's, a, that's a shame. because It's a great book, but we were both talking like, Oh yeah. Well, I wonder like, we know Gewurz is going to win. I wonder if we're going to get second, third, or fourth place. And that, So, like, I did not see it coming. I didn't expect it. Like, I've seen great historical books, like the Buddy Rogers book, not really get recognized like it should have in that way. So I didn't expect it, and I don't know what the difference was. I really don't, and I'm just glad that it happened because it was like a dream for me because – uh, I know people take issue and, you know, Dave has his supporters, his detractors, the Observer does too. As far as I'm concerned, that Observer Book Award is the top book, uh, is the top award that a wrestling book can win, as far right. as I know. So I was excited about it. Well, I, I think I know why you, you won the award. It's really good. <laughs> I mean, folks, if you haven't read it out there and you're listening to the sound of our voices, Get a Kindle version if you if you don't read books. Read this book. The last chapter, I was so moved by the last chapter. That's what I wrote about when I write, wrote in, in your Facebook area. I was blown away by the last chapter because you, you actually meticulously and brilliantly paid tribute to his whole attitude, his whole lifestyle, who he was, why he did what he did. I, I was so moved by the last words in, in that book. I can't even put it into words. It was the best wrestling book I have ever read. I'm not blowing smoke at you. It's the book I always wanted to read about the Sheik. You really did an incredible job on that volume, man. I, I don't know what to tell you other than thanks. It's awesome. I can't believe how much you're putting me over here, Bob. I, I don't know what to say to this. I hope, I, I mean, I'm flattered. I, I, I do like to hope and think maybe that I will be remembered for some of the work I've done with wrestling because it's an area that I love writing about. And because I'm, you know, I'm an English literature major. I'm, I love books. I love words. If, if wrestling didn't exist, I'd still be writing. I'd still be writing books. I'd still mm -hmm. be publishing something. So I try to bring that to what I'm doing. So it's not just, um, you know, a dry kind of collection of facts. I, I'm trying to write it with feeling so that it has value beyond just informationally, if that makes sense. I want it mm -hmm. to be 
a good read, an enjoyable book that you can read, even if you don't even care about the Sheik or never heard of him. Right. That you could still go, I'm I'm enjoying reading this book. Like that's I don't know, that doesn't always happen with wrestling books. And and that's what I was trying to do with with this book is make it go beyond wrestling fans, people who would give it a chance and say, you know, this looks like an interesting topic. So if it if it worked, which I guess it did, I'm mm-hmm. I'm very glad. And now I have a very tough act to follow with this monsoon <laughs> book. I'm getting very nervous. <laughs> I, I'll tell you what, you you pick such a unique subject matter. And right, you're surprised nobody thought of it, but I'm glad you did think of it because I know what to expect now and I'm really looking forward to it. I'm also looking forward to superheroes, the history of a pop culture phenomenon from Ant Man and Zorro. This is the prolific Brian R. Solomon. Brian, I can't thank you enough for both allowing me on your fine pack podcast and coming on mine. Uh, this has been a, such a treat. I can't put it in words. The high water mark for this show, and I really do appreciate everything you've done. Well, thank you, Bob. It's a pleasure to talk about wrestling and to talk about my work, and and I'm I'm really glad that you appreciate it so much. That means a lot to me. Tell people where they can find you. Sure. Well, I mean, there's the podcast, as we talked about, which is mm-hmm. called Shut Up and Wrestle with Brian R. Solomon. You can find it wherever you get podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, the whole thing. We have our website for it, which is suawpod.com. And if you're looking for me on social media, I'm Brian R. Solomon on Twitter and Instagram. And I have an author page on Facebook, uh, Brian Solomon Writer. You can find me there, too. Excellent. Folks, this is Brian R. Solomon. Uh, read his books. I promise you, you're going to have a hell of a time. Brian, thanks again, man. You're welcome. Much like Mike Leotis of Wrestler Weekly, uh, Brian Solomon is someone I could talk to all night long about wrestling. I could just picture all of us in a bar with our favorite libation talking about the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, all the stuff we've experienced and watched, just like all of you guys. And, you know, the most important people in wrestling are still the fans, and they always will be. And that's why I want to hear from you, all of you. There's plenty of places to get through to us. Um, look for me on Twitter as Bob Smith NYC. Write to our official email address at outdatedwrestling at gmail.com. That's outdatedwrestling at gmail. Uh, we have a website, Outdated Wrestling Hour dot buzzsprout.com and facebook i'm plain old robert smith you know plain name what, what am i going to do with it you know but we do want to hear from you look for us you know drop me a message anywhere you'd like to and uh, a lot of times i will read them on the air and i want you to know we have a lot of tremendous guests a whole line of guests every week and some people you may have heard of some people you may not have but they're all going to be great Um, I'm having a blast and I hope you're enjoying reminiscing about old school wrestling along with us. So I want to thank you all for being here. So in honor of Brian R. Solomon, I'll leave you with the words of Gorilla Monsoon when he was a lead announcer on WWF describing an injury. He has the lower occipital protuberance. 